We want to remind our listeners that this program is for informational and educational purposes only and not intended to substitute for professional veterinary and medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The Animal Medical Center does not recommend or endorse any products or services advertised by SiriusXM. Welcome to Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. This is the place to talk about your pets and get advice with a top veterinarian from the Animal Medical Center in NYC. Hear from the leading authorities on animals and give us a call to ask your questions. Now, here's your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Well, hello to everyone out there, and welcome to Ask the Vet on Sirius XM Stars Channel 109. Um, if you're a new listener, thanks so much, and if you're coming back, thanks to you as well. I'm your host, Ann Hohenhaus. I'm a board-certified internal medicine specialist and cancer specialist at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center here in New York City, where I'm broadcasting from. We're the largest not-for-profit animal hospital in the world. This radio program is also a podcast, and you can get this podcast downloaded at any standard podcast platform. And Ask the Vet comes to you as a podcast thanks to our partnership with Sirius XM Radio. At the Animal Medical Center, we keep families together by providing the absolute best pet care possible. If you've got a question about your pet's health, just call and leave me a message on our toll-free voicemail. I'll answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet program. The number to call is 866-993-8267. And if you don't have a pen and paper to copy that number down, I'll give that again a couple more times during the show. And stay tuned because I'm gonna answer listener questions a bit later in this program. And now it's time for our trending animal. It's time for the internet's most talked about animal. This is incredible story. Making heroes out of rats. The Hero Rats Project is training these mostly despised rodents to help with earthquake rescues. Yup, rescuing people, rats rescuing people who are trapped in earthquake debris. These rats are being trained to wear tiny backpacks, fully equipped with location detectors, video gear, and microphones, so the animals can help human rescuers locate survivors stuck in earthquake debris. So far, seven rats have gone through this training with research scientist Dr. Donna Keane from Glasgow, Scotland. Interestingly, each rodent only took two weeks to get up to speed on the necessary tasks to scuttle through the earthquake debris and head to people and bring them this life-saving equipment. During their training, these rats are using homemade prototype backpacks containing a microphone and then they're sent into mock debris. Once trained, these rodents will get the chance to work in the field when they are sent to Turkey, which is a country prone to frequent earthquakes. Dr. Keene is working with the nonprofit organization APOPO, that's A-P-O-P-O, which started this Hero Rats program. And in total, APOPO has trained about 170 rats who detect tuberculosis and brucellosis, which is an infectious disease impacting livestock, and then those livestock give that disease to people. And now their third project for Ipopo is the Earthquake Survivors Project. If you're interested in this project and want more information, just simply Google rats trained to help in earthquakes. Today we have an extra special guest. And once I get done introducing her, you'll understand why she's so special to us here at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. It's my pleasure to welcome Susan Sharp, owner of Susan Sharp Design LLC, to ask the vet. Susan is a registered architect with over 30 years of experience in the design of a wide variety of projects. And in 2005, her focus shifted when she began planning and working on veterinary teaching hospital facilities for universities in the Southeast, North Carolina State, University of Florida, University of Georgia, and I've been to all those hospitals and they are spectacularly gigantic, wonderful open spaces. And then also Louisiana State University, which I've not been lucky enough to go to. Susan established Susan Sharp Design after concluding her commitment to the design construction and warranty phases of the University of Georgia's Veterinary Medical Center and the Veterinary Education Center. 
Her role during this project spanned from programming and design through the construction phases, and then the primary representative of the college during the construction move-in startup and warranty phases of the project. This project put Susan and I at one degree of separation, even though she's in Georgia and I'm in here in New York, because on the Georgia project, she worked very closely with my good friend, Sheila Allen, who was Dean at the University of Georgia during the teaching hospital project. Today, Susan Sharp is working with a New York City design team on a massive 37,000 square foot expansion and renovation here at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center and spearheading the veterinary specific space and equipment. So now you see why Susan is an extra special guest and so important to us here at AMC. So Susan, welcome to Ask the Vet. Thank you. Glad to be here. So let's start at the beginning. Um, I, I'll confess, I never would have in my wildest dreams thought about being an architect. So how do you, how do you decide to become an architect or what, what catch, captures you about it? <laughs> oh, I, you know, as a kid, my brother and I would build forts and like to, you know, create those spaces, but I didn't always want to be an architect. I actually thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, it was a veterinarian or an architect. <laughs> so um, I started in pre-vet and um, after one semester of college chemistry, um, changed my mind, <laughs> you know. And uh, anyway, I, I took a class with my brother, architecture appreciation, trying to figure out for sure what I wanted to do. And anyway, one week in that class, I decided that's what I wanted to be. Um, I wanted to be a veterinarian when I was a child too, and my brother and I used to play veterinarian, um, <laughs> and he was a veterinarian as well. Um, so, so siblings don't fall too far from the tree. That's right. So, I, in my ignorance about architecture, I have to tell you that I thought architects designed buildings, but. It, when I read your intro and your job is to outfit this place once we get it built, um, I, I think I don't really understand what architects do. So can you correct my um, mistaken belief here? Oh, well, you're right. I mean, we, we design the buildings, you know, and I think our primary responsibility is health, safety, and welfare of the occupants of the building that, um, you know, there's a lot of us that specialize and some are just interior architects, which is sort of what I've become, you know, I've kind of become totally focused on that. Uh, but then there's others that are focused on the outside and, and even some that just on the details. So it's, it's, there's lots of avenues that you can take as an architect. Well, I started to, you know, when I, I thought about that question, I started to muse and then realized that Frank Lloyd Wright, who, who's, you know, well, in my non-architectural mind, I think is one of the most famous American architects. And he, he designed down to the square millimeter of whatever he was designing. Because if you go to any of his buildings, he did the furniture that That's went right. in the building, not just the outside of the building and the inside of the building. So I, I don't know, maybe maybe I was just not thinking very hard about architecture. <laughs> um, but but so you're much more like Frank Lloyd Wright then. Kind of, I think so. <laughs> so then how did you get focused on veterinary teaching hospital facilities? Well, it kind of started when I was in architecture school. Um, when I was in third year architecture, Hills Pet Products sponsored a competition for the third year class, and our professors paired us with third year veterinary students, and they acted as our clients. We had to design a, a small and large animal clinic for our clients, and um, I placed in the competition, and, and it, it had to be my favorite project the whole, my whole school career. But then after um, working on a variety of projects, you know, for many years, I had the opportunity to move back home and I went back to work for a firm uh, that I worked for as a student, but they happened to specialize in veterinary teaching hospitals. And so I, I had the privilege of, of working on, you know, the North Carolina state and the Florida and Auburn and LSU while I was working there. 
and, and, and I, for any listeners that haven't been there, these facilities are so not what the Shoresman Animal Medical Center is going to be, meaning <laughs> that they are acres like we're getting 37,000 square feet but it seemed to me when I toured the Florida facilities I thought I was going to drop dead at the end of the day they are just gargantuan um, and so we're going to have wonderful great facilities here but our space will be vertical not horizontal um, and what else will our facilities do here well the you know, like you say, it's it's a very vertical and it's it's tight, and um, you're gonna you're gonna end up with a very well designed space. I equate it to a boat. Um, everything is gonna have a home, <laughs> but you will definitely have more space. Um, I don't know if you you know the building is it's eight stories occupied floors, but um, level two has a larger floor plate. And so what we're going to do is expand the building on level three and four to match the level two floor plate. And that's going to allow you to get the bigger, nicer space. It also allows us to have some swing space while that space is being built. Um, I don't know if you want me to get into the details of that right now, but that's just a, a big picture view of what's going on. So I, I have a normal route that I take back around the neighborhood and I happen to digress from that route. And I, I'll, I should say, I'll get your email from, uh, from Barbara Ross, but the, the building, it, for those people who haven't seen it in a while, it's, it's starting to have like a form. You can see what's going on. Have you been to New York lately to see it? No, I haven't. I'll, I'll send you the pictures, but it mm -hmm. the whole thing where this floor plate is extending um, for people who know the building, it's extending towards 61st Street or extending um, south and going up over that little part that stuck out before. Um, mm -hmm. So right now it's a giant mass of steel that doesn't have too much form to it. And then we got swathed in... Um, mesh uh a while scaffolding ago. and mesh. yeah and then now there's mesh everywhere too like i can't see outside my window and i'm having a panic attack that my plants are not going to be doing well because i have an <laughs> east facing window and they do so well here mm. um so why don't you talk about how planning a veterinary teaching hospital is different than some large commercial space like for example a home depot or um, a bed bath and beyond those are big commercial spaces but I think probably very different than the commercial space you're making here. Sure. Um, well, maybe the best way to help everybody understand, I, th I think most everybody's familiar with a human hospital. And, um, it, you know, a lot of the uh, spaces, they're the same. You have the same support spaces. You've got the pharmacy, the facilities management, laundry, central stores, the sterile supply. Um, and much of the same equipment, but instead of beds, you know, the animals have special housing, cages and kennels. And, um, and then the other design considerations are, you know, dealing with the odors and noise and all the finishes have to be robust and cleanable and withstand harsh chemicals and wash down. Um, you know, these are animals and they do have accidents. So, um, but it, that's really the primary thing is, you know, the housing of the animals and understanding that and, and how to clean the space well when you need to clean it. So you design spaces so we can clean them well. <laughs> That's why, <one>. yes, yes. <laughs> and also have a place for everything. Yeah, I, I like I like it when there's a place for everything and there's not clutter about. Uh, it makes me really happy. Um, so when did you jump into the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center project? Um, well, I, I was asked by a local firm to, to be the veterinary consultant and the equipment planner on the project. We started the design work in early 2018. 
So, so this project, which won't be done for like a couple more years, has already been going <laughs> for four years. Um, That's just, right. Just so people uh, listening out there understand that that the pain everyone is feeling right now has has been it's been a big ramp up to that. Uh, to this current situation where every day people are moving here, there, and the client patterns change. And I'm sure, I'm sure the only, the only creatures that are not too disturbed by this whole thing is, is our animal patients who are mostly pretty flexible, but you know, Mm -hmm. the clients one day are sitting here and then it moves over somewhere else. And that's going to keep, keep going for a while because that's right. The hospital can't shut down. Uh, no. the pets, the pets of New York need us. And if, if we shut down, then there's a lot of people here who don't have a job. So, uh, there's, there's not an option to shut down. So what challenges are you involved in any of that? Um, I am, I, you know, we have a, an owner architect contractor meeting every Tuesday. So we, we have this call and we get the updates from the contractor and, um, yes, I'm, I'm definitely aware of all of those challenges, but I'm I, I kind of working with all the groups, the administration at AMC, the design team, the contractor, and um, you know, there's RFIs that come out regularly, you know, wanting to understand. Uh, that's a request for information um, from the construction team. You know, when they have a question about the the documents or if there's an unforeseen condition. Um, you know, they'll, we're always involved in, in helping answer the question or, or make a decision because sometimes we have to change a space because something, for something unforeseen. So it, it, give an example of, of what it is that you would have to change around for something unforeseen. I mean, I'm like, okay, so you got a building, you put up a wall, you put up some beams. Well, being a high rise, uh, there's a lot of chases in your building. What's a lot a of pipe. pipe. <laughs> it's, it's basically a hole that punches through the whole building and goes vertically. So like to get water up to the eighth floor, you've got to have pipes that carry that up or, or carry it down. And um, so you have to have these holes essentially all around the building. And they're not just in one spot. They're usually distributed across the floor plate. And um, so we have one area, we knew we had these pipe chases and um, the, they took up more space than we anticipated. And we had planned um, some cabinetry to go on this wall. And so we had to reconfigure, you know, the, the cabinets around that. Instead of being a horizontal configuration, they had to go more vertical and um, just things like that happen. So a uh- if we were building a two story, you know, big, long veterinary hospital like Florida, for example, then mm-hmm. they don't have chases in those. I mean, how does the water get they, from here to there? They do, but it generally it's within the mechanical room. And so in a way you have distributed mechanical and plumbing it, instead of it being a chunk, you know, whether it's, you know, you do have a big mechanical room on your roof. Um, but you still, it's just more distributed and it, and it affects like all the spaces. Um, we, um, even the, when we put the fire pump in, I know that that was kind of like a, um, uh, concern and, and it had to be kind of right in the middle of everything. And this was during the design process that we were working this out. And so we had to kind of redesign around the fire pump room. And, and then of course, you know, the electrical, when they're moving the electrical room, that whole main line is coming through the building in this spot. And so it again created another chase where we hadn't planned on there being a chase. So it's things like that that happen when you have these high rise. I'm sure that's it's probably normal, you know, for the designers, you know, to work on any of the buildings in New York City. Um, but that's it's very different. Know, from what I'm used to. So um, talk about what are the specific requirements for a veterinary specific space? Um, 
Well, the I think I touched on some of that earlier with the cages and mm-hmm. the, the dog runs or, or kennels. Um, oh, talk about our outdoor uh, dog runs that are coming. That's right. Um, well, that, you know, you, the first time I came to your building, I remember noticing that. It's like, oh, they, they don't really have anywhere to walk their dog. They just kind of they have to relieve themselves on the sidewalk out front, you know, and um, now the even if they they want to take a, an animal from level three, they have to come downstairs and walk them outside. And so now we're going to put this run area on the roof and it'll be right adjacent to your special care unit. And they'll be able to just walk right out that door onto the roof without having to get on the elevator, and go downstairs with these really, the animals are scared, you know? And so to me, it's going to be so nice to have that space. That's how you know a suburban dog from an urban dog. When you you get on the elevator and the urban dog thinks it's normal that they're in a room that's moving and the suburban dog crouches down on all four and kind of looks around because they say, well, why is this room moving? I'm not <laughs> used to right. this. Um, so <laughs> there's, there's a definite difference between the city dog and city dogs know they have to pee on the concrete. Wherever. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, the suburban dogs are like, I'm just going to hold it till I get home. You know, they, they, <laughs> if I explode, it's okay. But it, people are like, have you not walked my dog? And we'll be like, we walked him every two hours. He doesn't know he should go on the concrete. So, mm. so I'm, I'm hoping that's why I'm all excited about this outdoor run is, is I think that, that the patients will be so much happier um, yes. if, if they think there's some, they have some fake grass to go on kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's right. So that's going to be a huge um, addition. The other thing is it, it, the building design. If, if you've been recently to AMC, there's kind of a schematic of the new building on, on the posters on, in various places in the building. But there's going to be a lot of windows in the new, in parts of the new section. And I think that's a huge thing because this building has great light except whoever designed it the first go around didn't take advantage of the Mm. fact that we have great great views and and even if it's not a view it's really good light and that makes when they opened up the eighth floor area to take advantage of the windows on the eighth floor so that everybody in the waiting room was exposed to that light it got to be such a much better place It is. That is very nice. And and that is something that we kept in mind, even uh, like I, I like to make sure that the, the staff can see all the animals from anywhere in the treatment space. And which meant it pushed the cages to the, in front of the glass, (laughs) but, but we still made sure that we kept that daylight coming in above the cages. And um, I think that is going to be really nice. Yeah, I think it it makes it better for the people. And it gives, although, you know, in a 24-7 hospital, we don't turn out the lights very much here. Mm -mm. And so I don't, clients don't always realize that their pet comes home and it's really tired because we're, we're, we're running 24 seven. So if your dog is in intensive care, there's a nurse and a doctor in there or more than one doctor in there the whole night long and the lights aren't off and there's noise. And so your pet who's used to being, you know, on your bed or on the sofa doesn't really get to sleep because it's not dark and night. So hopefully windows and and a definite distinction between day and night will help some of those animals sleep better when they're here Um, and I think that um, you know like when our cat went home from ICU it slept for three straight days Um, and while she was she was really sick too but but and then she woke up and she was okay so have you had any pets that have gone to any hospitals you've designed Oh, yes. Actually, our, um, my husband's dog is a blue healer and, and she's a, a working dog. And um, she got really sick a year ago and we had to take her to the University of Georgia. 
and she she had to have emergency surgery. If we hadn't gotten her there, she would have died. And um, it was it was pretty interesting to be on that side because then we they let us after she got through surgery, she survived, and then she survived the first night. Um, they let us come and see her once a day, and you know to be in the space while she's in her little cage. Um, it just it was everybody was really great and. Um, they took care of her for sure. So Saved what, her life. But but how did you grade your space from the from the customer <laughs> standpoint? Would you give yourself an A? Uh, maybe. Um, you know the the thing that something we did on a, a project because we had the space. Um, we had a visitation room, and um, that I thought would we actually had one in this project early on, but we we had to, it had to go away because we didn't have the space, but it, it's nice, you know, when somebody comes in to see their animal and they might still need to be connected to tubes and, um, you know, you can sit down with them. So it, we were sitting in the middle of ICU, just right in front of the cage and we had the, the cage door open and, um, but we were sitting on the floor, you know, right in the middle of all the activity. So um, that, that might be something that I would do differently you know, maybe allow for, but, you know, I know you can't move them, you know, ideally the, you just want to keep them as still as possible when they're in, in that kind of shape. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to do there, except that, yeah, you just have to be in the middle of the activity. They were stepping over us and around us. And, <laughs> yep. That's how veterinary ICUs are, which is so different than the human ICU, which is, um, you know, there's like a room that's yours in a human ICU and, and there's a lot more monitoring equipment that feeds back to the nurse's station. Mm -hmm. Well, I, the producers tell me that our time is up and I just want to thank Susan Sharp for joining me today on Ask the Vet. And maybe back when we get a uh, ribbon cutting coming up or something, we'll, we'll, we'll have you back and we'll talk again about how the Finnis project uh, stacks up against uh, your dreams and plans for the new version of the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. Thanks so much, Susan. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you another time. Thank you. It was fun. Do you have a question about your pet's health? Just call and leave me a message on our toll-free voicemail, and I'll answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet. The toll-free number is 866-993-8267. Please stay tuned because Animal News will be right after this short break. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Call now with your pet questions on Sirius XM Stars. Welcome back to Ask the Vet here on Sirius XM Stars Channel 109. Now it's time for animal news. It's time for animal headlines, the biggest animal news from across the world. Our first story today is about firefighters in West Sacramento, California, and they have a not so secret weapon and maybe a smelly weapon to fight fires, goats, and a lot of goats. Sacramento regularly uses hundreds of goats to clear out dry brush, high grass, and weeds that can easily go up in flames, especially during the droughts that we've been having lately. Feisty goats will eat everything and anything, which creates a fire break in the environment. According to Paul Hosley, the public information officer for West Sacramento, these goats have been helping to prevent forest fires for the last 10 years. 400 goats can clean two full acres in a single day. And they actually do a better job than mowers do because they can get right up around trees and under bushes and things. This innovative program has been good for goats because they have lots of things to eat that they like and even better for the firefighters because it prevents forest fires. Just Google goats help firefighters in Sacramento, California. And for those of you who are local here in New York, we've got goats too. Uh, they're keeping the weeds down in Riverside Park for the past few years. And according to a news article on uh, Patch, I think it was, the new group of goats arrived just last week. So if you wanna see goats in action, head down to Riverside Park. Our second story comes to us from India. An unusual pair of patients wandered outside the door of Dr. Ahmed's medical clinic. It was a wild monkey and her baby. 
And I looked at pictures of these monkeys and I'm not really sure what type of monkey they are. I just know that I've seen them uh, in Southeast Asia uh, as well. Uh, they're kind of cute, they're not very big. According to the India Times, Dr. Ahmed noticed that the monkey standing outside his clinic had an injury on her head and that the baby had a hurt leg. So he kind of motioned for the monkeys to come inside and the mother monkey sat calmly clutching her baby while Dr. Ahmed administered uh, tetanus injections to them and spread ointment on the wounds of both the mama and the baby's leg. After receiving the treatment, the mother monkey and her baby were allowed to rest on the clinic's bed as a crowd of curious onlookers gathered to see Dr. Ahmed's most unusual patients. Mother and daughter reportedly are, were well enough to leave the clinic on their own accord, making it a very happy ending, um, partly because of Dr. Ahmed's wonderful care and also because the mother knew that she exactly where she should bring her baby. You can find the story on the dodo. Just Google dodo and mother monkey and baby in India and get help from the human doctor and a whole bunch of really cute monkey photos are gonna pop up. And finally, this is my personal favorite story, only because I'm missing the 146th annual Westminster Kennel Club show, which once again was held north of New York City at the historic Lyndhurst Estate in Tarrytown. The last February was supposed to be in its usual place um, at Madison Square Garden, but because of COVID, it got canceled and moved to Tarrytown. This uh, June show featured nearly 3,500 dogs, over 200 breeds, and two new dog breeds, the Mo Moody and the Russian Toy. Google them for fun, Moody, M-U-D-I, and the Russian Toy, just like it sounds. The grand winner was Trumpet the Bloodhound, got kudos for being best in show, becoming the first bloodhound ever to win the title. And while the dogs got the spotlight this year, Westminster Kennel Club put a special focus on a very human issue, veterinarians' well-being. In fact, the Westminster Kennel Club gifted $10,000 to a charity focused on the psychological welfare of veterinarians. And my colleague and AMC's veterinary social worker, Judith Harbour, was interviewed for and quoted in an Associated Press article entitled At Westminster, New Focus on Veterinarians' Well-Being, which was picked up by hundreds of newspapers across the country. So congratulations to Judith on that. Dr. Jose Arque, president of the American Veterinary Medical Association and a recent guest here on Ask the Vet, was also interviewed. In 2021, AMC's critical care service provided life-saving care to more than 22,000 patients. That's about 160 patients each day. All these patients were treated under one expanding roof, as we heard from Susan Sharp earlier in the show, by AMC specialists who work together across 20 specialties and services. If you're interested in learning more about our emergency room, AMC has a new video blog, Notes from the ER, which is an exclusive and intimate look at a day in the life of my colleague, Dr. Carly Fox, senior veterinarian at AMC's emergency service. If you watch a video, you'll get a peek at some of Dr. Fox's interesting cases, from a cat who fell from a high rise building to a sweet dog who got into a scuffle with a porcupine. And speaking of unusual cases, last week, our emergency room admitted a high-rise turtle, fell three stories, lived to tell about it, and ended up with a cracked shell. Just log on to our website, which is www.amcny.org, and in the search bar, put notes from the ER. Don't forget, if you have a pet health question, call and leave me a message. It's that simple, and I'll answer your questions on next month's show. The number is 866-993-8267. And that reminds me, it's time to go to questions from our listeners. Our first question today comes from Cindy in Nashville. Hey, this is Cindy from Nashville. And I have a question about our two-year-old. Um, she is a Chihuahua Shih Tzu mix. And we just love her to death, Lola. 
is her name, um, and Lola is a bundle of energy, which is awesome, but she's eating our house away. Lola has eaten um, stairs, the bottom of stairs. She has eaten um, dressers. Um, she has eaten an arm, uh, another armoire. She's eaten a, a dining credenza. So what she's doing is she's just kind of chewing on the bottom of these uh, pieces of furniture in our home. So I'm trying to figure out what we can do to prevent her from doing this. And um, so any advice would be very much appreciated. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye. Oh boy, Lola is the proverbial bad dog. So Lola needs some serious training. Um, some dogs, especially high energy dogs, are ones that need need really to have a lot of work done on, with them to get them to behave. And so I would start with basic obedience training because if you can teach Lola to sit on command then the minute you see those lips and teeth on your furniture get her to sit that distracts her from the process of chewing up more of your furniture then once you get her to stop chewing you can reward her for that and positive reinforcement not to chew the furniture is going to work wonders in getting her to stop in the meantime, it's going to take some time to obedience train her and get her to listen to you. Then I think that she probably needs to spend some time in her crate or in a safe area where there's something that she can't chew behind a baby gate. Uh, and since she's a chihuahua, that should be pretty easy to find a gate that will keep her away from things that she can chew. Or a nice big crate where she has plenty of room for a bed and food and water and space to move around. So that you separate her from the furniture and protect your furniture while you're teaching her good manners to sit and then able to distract her. The other thing I would do is give her objects that you want her to chew and praise her and give her treats for chewing those things that are not your very nice furniture. And I think that the positive reinforcement of obedience training and giving her things you want her to chew should go a long way to helping Lola correct this very bad behavior that she's developed. Good luck, Cindy, and thanks so much for calling Ask the Vet. Our next caller is Ileana, who has a sheepadoodle. Hi, my name is Ileana. I have a question. Um, I have a 10-month-old sheepadoodle who went into heat. When her heat was over, she ended up getting a UTI. And the reason I knew that she had a UTI was because when she was going to the restroom on her artificial grass, it was like um, she jumped, like it was stinging her to go to the restroom. So took her to the bed. She had a UTI. Well, now, um, what? Two, three weeks later, I'm having an issue getting her to go to the bathroom outside on the turf. So just wanted to see, is this normal? What can I do to make changes? Just need some help with that. Thank you. So, Ileana, I don't think this is normal behavior at all. Um, a couple of things could be going on. One is sometimes there are urinary tract infections that are just simply resistant to the bacteria or to the antibiotic that you've chosen. So one thing is head back to the veterinarian so that they can test that urine and see if there's a better antibiotic that should be used. While you're there, the other thing to consider is has um, your sheepadoodle developed bladder stones? I know she's young, but there are young dogs who will develop bladder stones and bladder stones will cause recurrent signs of urinary tract infections. And then on the chance that, that her behavior is that she's kind of upset because it was so painful to urinate when she had that urinary tract infection that she doesn't want to urinate. She, there's nothing wrong with her. She just associates discomfort with it. Be sure that when she does pee where you want her to, that you give her lots of treats and lots of praise because that will reinforce that um, going to the bathroom is uh, the thing that you want her to do. So good luck with the sheepadoodle, Ileana, and thanks very much for calling us here at Ask the Vet. And our next call comes from California, John. Hello, my name is John. I'm calling from Newport Beach, California. I just have a question about my Labrador. She 
Portuguese, uh, yellow Labrador, English Labrador. I don't think that makes a difference, but she um, she is only five years old, and she has in her left eye she has a little bit of film, like in just this tiny like little like light film in her left eye, and the vet had said that that was when like she had her eye scratched and it's true like when she was a puppy this dog like ran out and like just attacked her like for no reason and like scratched her eye um but i'm just noticing now in the right eye that um that she has the same thing is kind of starting to develop and we have been to the vet recently with hot spots and all this stuff so i'm just reluctant to go to the vet again um just for this and i don't think it's anything major but i want to know why she would possibly be developing something like that at age five i've had labradors before um this is stuff that i've seen in older dogs not in a five-year-old dog that's my question um i don't know that's my question thank you so john it's really common for a dog that's gotten a bad scratch on their eye to develop like a white area of scarring it's it's basically the same as a scar when you get a bad scrape or scratch on your leg or arm it doesn't heal quite a hundred percent normally but it seems weird to me that the opposite eye would develop the same exact thing without a history of a scratch in the eye. So another thing to consider is that some dogs will accumulate lipid or fat in their in their corneas. That's the clear part of the eye. And I don't really know why that happens, but but I know that it will also look white in the eye. And since both eyes are affected, that would be one thought I have. Second thought I have is that as dogs and people age, their lenses become less clear. And so if the whole eye was looking hazy, then I would be wondering if maybe she just had what we call um, nuclear sclerosis, which is a kind of opacification of the lens of the eye. And then of course, the last thing is a cataract. And there are some dogs that will develop cataracts very young, which is a degeneration of the lens of the eye. So my suggestion is that maybe this dog needs to go to a veterinary ophthalmologist. That's an eye specialist for dogs. And if you go to www.acvo, that stands for American College of Veterinary Ophthalmology, .org, you should be able to find an ophthalmologist near you who can help sort out whether there's lipid in the eye or really a scar or maybe early cataracts going on. Uh, because you can do cataract surgery in dogs and that would give this Labrador its best chance at good vision. Uh, so thanks so much for calling us with such an interesting question, John. And if you remember, call us and tell us what the outcome is. And our last question today is, uh, the caller didn't give their name, but it's also an eye question. Hi, I have a question for the vet, and it's about retinal deterioration in a 12-year-old Maltese. I took my dog to one ophthalmologist, now I'm taking her to a second one. Is there any hope? I was told that there's nothing they can do about it. And my location is Southern California. My name is Gabrielle. Thank Thanks, Gabrielle. Um, so Gabrielle's asking a question about a different part of the eye. She's asking about the retina, which is the back part of the eye, the seeing part. And there, there are two kinds of retinal degeneration. Um, one is um, a progressive retinal atrophy, and that tends to run in certain breeds of animals where the retina just kind of stops working um, and uh, no longer can perceive light or darker color. And then the other type is something called sudden acquired retinal degeneration. And that 
doesn't really have particular breed predispositions and the dog is fine one day and then acutely blind another day. And since we don't know what causes that, we don't really have a good treatment for that. So I think a second opinion from another ophthalmologist is a good idea, but if the second ophthalmologist concurs with the first, then I have to think that there's not too much that can be done for this Maltese. But for everybody out there, remember that um, blind animals can be wonderful pets. They will ne negotiate and navigate around your home with no problem, but you just have to be very careful if you move or do a reconstruction job because the animal have to learn to get around. So just keep that in mind. But a blind pet um, can be a wonderful pet um, in your home. And so with that, that's our last question for the day. And we'll take a break and then I'll come back for, with news from the Animal Medical Center. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Call now with your pet questions on Sirius XM Stars. Hi, and welcome back here to the news from the Animal Medical Center here on Ask the Vet at Sirius XM Stars Channel 109. Pet parents everywhere, listen up. The Animal Medical Center's Used An Institute for Animal Health Education has a wealth of pet information for you. First, there's the Usdan Institute's Pet Health Library, which is the leading online user-friendly platform to find accurate and trusted pet health information at no cost to you. All the content is verified by the veterinary experts here at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. And all you need to do to find that pet health library is go to www.amcny.org and kind of on the right side of the homepage, you'll see pet health library in a very nice light blue color. Click there and there you have it. Pet parents can also attend the USDAN Institute's free virtual monthly pet health events and can also receive a free weekly newsletter packed with useful pet health information, tips and tricks. If you are interested in signing up for that, you just simply need to go to amcny.org and put in use Dan, and that will take you to the place where you can sign up to get these, this information that will pop right into your inbox every week. All of the Used and Pet Health events, including the Animal Lovers Book Club events, um, are can be streamed from AMC's website, and you need, just need to put events into the search bar. Uh, last week, I was very lucky to spend an hour with Bill Schutt, who's the author of Pump, A Natural History of the Heart. And we talked about hearts of all kinds of animals, uh, from fish, up to whales and even a little bit on people hearts and a touched on heartworm disease as well. Join us for the next virtual event, which is Pet Food Basics. Now, this is always a very popular one when we have a nutritionist on the program. Pet Food Basics is choose how to choose the right diet for your dog or cat. That's going to be on Wednesday, July 27th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and will be held on Zoom. Uh, the speaker for that evening is a wonderful nutritionist that I know named Lisa Weath. She's board certified um, in nutrition and also a member of the World Small Animal Association Global Nutrition Committee. If you want to learn about the general nutrition your pet needs and how to create a diet plan that will keep your four leg family member happy and healthy, then this is the seminar for you. Uh, that requires you to sign up, but of course it's free. Uh, you have to sign up so you get the Zoom link in time. Now, if you happen to have a child who's eight to 10, the USDAN Institute is once again hoping hosting whew, AMC's Vet Camp Online. This is another Zoom program and will run from August 8th to August 12th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. Children will, will virtually meet AMC veterinarians, learn how to care for animals. 
Each of the five days of camp focuses on a new topic and also comes with a fun activity. Registration is limited so that the children that attend, in fact, can have a really, really good experience. If you're interested in signing your child up for camp, remember registration is free um, as it is for all used and events and you just need to pre-register your child. I think if the course happens to be full when you go to log in, I think you can also put your child on a waiting list. And if demand is a lot, maybe we can twist the arms of the folks in the Used End Institute to offer another uh, week of camp again. Now, I'd like to thank my special guest today, architect Susan Sharp, who's helping to build the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center of uh, the next century here with us. And I hope I can have her on another time to talk about how the project's going. I wanna thank um, all our listeners and callers and everyone who's downloaded the Ask the Vet podcast. If you haven't had time to do it, you can download Ask the Vet from any podcast platform. Don't forget, if you have a question about your pet's health, call and leave me a voicemail on our toll-free answering machine, and I'll answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet program. One last time, the number to call is 866-993-8267. Don't forget to check us out on social media. On Facebook, it's The Animal Medical Center, and Twitter and Instagram, it's AMCNY. Be sure to subscribe and like to where you get your podcasts so you get all the new episodes of Ask the Vet in your podcast feed. And I'll be back next month on Ask the Vet here on Sirius XM Stars Channel 109. Thanks for listening, everyone. See you next month.